Well, I'm looking for when I add a book to my collection, I'm looking for A, just bestsellers, things that are high interest, people that are requesting. And of course, we want to support local authors. I think the tricky thing comes in with the indie publishers, especially with the kids' books. So, so I feel like there's a difference between adult versus children. What I've had the experience with is, is children's authors that maybe have not done their homework, haven't done their research. Sometimes they just think that all they have to do is have this book in the library and all of a sudden everyone's going to want to read it and buy it. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 177 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. In today's episode, I have an interview with Julie Bonser and Michelle Rudder from Eastern Monroe Public Library in Pennsylvania. Julie Bonser graduated with a degree in elementary education, but somehow ended up in libraries. She's currently the head of youth services at the Eastern Monroe Public Library, but also has prior experience in circulation, cataloging, and adult reference. Serving kids and teens is her main passion, which keeps her energized, up-to-date, and endlessly entertained. Julie is a lifelong resident of the Pocono Mountains. She enjoys children's literature, board games, Tetris, and strumming the ukulele. Michelle Rudder is a teen services public librarian in northeastern Pennsylvania, along with her skeleton assistant, Bona Lisa. She is a lifelong bibliophile and has enjoyed teaching such a big word to little kids when she worked in school libraries. She's also worked in an academic library where she once cataloged a piece of heavy machinery as a joke because the facilities department parked it in the library for so long. When she's not perpetuating benign mayhem at work or reading, she enjoys dancing, yoga, and various creative pursuits. And uh, as you could tell, like me, Michelle has a skeletal companion named Bona Lisa. (laughs) Bona Lisa is a Halloween decoration given a greater afterlife as Michelle's pandemic companion and trusty sidekick on the job. She's a bit thin-skinned, but her work ethic is hard to beat as she has worked her fingers to the bone. Now, this is a fantastic interview with Julie and Michelle, and we get into so many intricacies and details, specifically in terms of youth. Uh, services and youth books for uh, libraries and and what it's like and the sort of an inside look at the library. So this interview is a little bit longer than normal. So to try to keep the runtime of this episode closer to the one hour mark, I'm going to forego my regular personal update and comments from recent episodes. And I'm going to skip right to this episode's sponsor. And right after the sponsor read, we're going to get right into the interview. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices, and because this episode is about libraries, if you're looking for a way to get your audiobook into the library market, look no further than Findaway Voices, because they can get your book into the markets that are mentioned by Michelle and Julie in this interview, as well as many more library markets and retailers around the world. Now, for the ad read for Findaway Voices, I'm going to share a recent update that they announced on their blog, and there will be a link to this uh, blog post in the show notes because there's a form to fill out, etc. Here's the ad read. Upload your previously exclusive audio titles in February to take advantage of a 10% royalty bonus in March 2021. Now is the time to take your audiobook distribution wide. Findaway Voices enables you to reach more listeners and sell more audiobooks in more places. For authors that are exclusive to ACX, you should know they've recently announced that you can move from exclusivity to non-exclusivity after 90 days. Say goodbye to seven years of exclusivity and hello to a bonus 10% royalty when you publish your titles wide with Findaway Voices in February 2021. This is a massive opportunity for you to sell more audiobooks than ever before. When you upload your ACX titles to Findaway Voices, 
you have control over setting your retail and library list price and can choose where you sell your books in over 40 channels. Now that's freedom. Sign up or log in to your Find Away Voices account now. Upload and publish your titles during February 2021. Fill out the form that there will be a link to in the show notes from their blog post after they're published and you'll receive a 10% royalty bonus on top of what you earn in your March 2021 royalty statement. As always, feel free to reach out to Findaway Voices with any questions by emailing support at findawayvoices.com. And if you want to look for more information about this, check out the show notes at starkreflections.ca or check out starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Julie and Michelle, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Hello. Hi. So I want to start, uh, let's start with Julie. Uh, Julie, um, your title, your role at the library, and then, um, yeah, we'll get into a little bit more right after the, the brief introductions. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm the head of youth services at the Eastern Monroe Public Library in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been at that library for almost 19 years. Um, yeah, if you can believe that. I started out actually as a circulation clerk and kind of moved my way up. So I've been in um, I've been adult services librarian, I've been a cataloging librarian, um, but I've been in my current role for about 10 years now. Wow, cool. Well, thank you. Uh, excellent. And, and Michelle, how about you? So I am the teen services librarian, also at Eastern Monroe Public Library. However, my um, job description is a little bit unique in that it, it, it goes beyond just that particular branch. So Eastern Monroe has um, two other branches besides the main one where I'm located. But then within the county um, of Monroe County, Pennsylvania, there are five other libraries uh, that I'm also servicing for providing programming for the teens of the community. Uh, and we've got kind of a wide variety of demographics from even though Stroudsburg is a small town, there's uh, quite a diverse population. And then as you move out into the outer uh, areas of the county, it, it becomes very rural. So uh, there's a lot of interesting um, differences in terms of, of what each library seems to be looking for. Uh, whereas Julie has a lot of experience at this particular, uh, in this particular system, I am a new hire and I started two weeks before the pandemic shut everything down. <laughs> so that's, that's um, interesting. Yeah, it has made uh, orienting to my job particularly interesting. I, my previous library experience though, I was a library paraprofessional for two urban elementary schools in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, I did that for several years. And then uh, for a couple of years, I was at a satellite campus for a community college, a local community college working in their library. Okay, cool. So I'm going to ask a lot of really newbie questions because I really want to understand some of the intricacies. But the very first one that I'm really, really curious about is, do you guys consider yourself book lovers? Is that what drew you to the, the library world? So... I actually, I am probably not typical. A lot of librarians that I work with are very avid, voracious readers. Um, if you had asked me back when I was a teenager, would I be working in a library? I would have said absolutely no way. Um, I went to school to become an elementary education teacher and, um, you know, loved it, went through it, got to the end of my senior year and went, yeah, this is good, but... Um, teachers work really hard and they have so many other things to do besides teaching, which didn't really occur to me when I had just started out. And I thought, you know what, I like education, but I don't think I want to go this route. Um, so now I have this degree and what are you going to do with an elementary education degree? Um, so I started looking into libraries, um, specifically I wanted, you know, youth services and I just kind of sort of started taking classes and kind of made my way in. Um, so yeah, I would not, have, would not have guessed that. I do like books, but I am definitely not one of those people that has to have a book. Um, right. So yeah. we won't find you at a book burning uh, camp out or anything like that, but, <laughs> but yeah. books wasn't what drew you there in the first place. <laughs> okay. Right, it was, it was people. People was what drew me there. Cool, excellent. How about you, Michelle? Oh, for me, yeah, I would definitely qualify as a book lover. Um, 
I, I'm getting ready to move and I spent part of the weekend packing my personal library and I'm up to 23 boxes of books and there's still quite a lot to go. So <laughs> like it's um, one van for the books and then one van for all the other furniture. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. Um, however, I am similar to Julie in that I started out in education. My degree, my undergraduate degree is in special education and uh, loved the kids, loved working with them and connecting them with literature and making things happen, um, but kind of burned out on the bureaucracy in that particular field, but still wanted to be involved in the educational process somehow. Right. And during the years that I was an at-home mom, I became involved in the Reading is Fundamental program. There was... Um, there was a lot of influx, people moving into the area. So there were a lot of different schools being built in our area. And as one of the schools was built, they needed a, a roof coordinator for that particular school. And so I took that on and kind of inherited piles and piles of books from other schools and other sources and had to be able to kind of sort through them and organize the chaos and I found that I really enjoyed bringing that order out of chaos and I really enjoyed being able to present all these books as an option to the kids. Basically the program allows for each school kid three times a year to pick a single book to take home and keep as their own um, and I really enjoyed the part of matching the reader up to a book. You know the idea that you know, we, we don't all enjoy the same thing, but hey, what, what do you dig? What's going to get you excited? What can I connect you with that you'll really enjoy? And the events were always held in the school library because that's where there was space for them. And after doing that for two or three years, I'm continuing to do it, but after a couple of years, the school librarian and I had established a rapport and she said, consider working in a library and I was like no actually I haven't talk to me about that a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of how I wound up going in that direction that's awesome it, it's funny that you talk about that um the connecting the right book to the right reader because in my history as a, as a bookseller that was one of the most enriching experiences when you can connect those people and, and I know that libraries actually connect people in ways well beyond just a book, right? The right reader to the right book. They have become, that is one fundamental part of it. Maybe like Amazon started as a bookstore, <laughs> but now it's the everything store. And I think in many ways, libraries may have started as, as places of book repositories, knowledge, but then they became so much more. Now, I want to first kind of go back to the designation of librarian isn't just you you got a job at a library, right? There's there's some sort of qualification. Can you guys explain what that is? Because I can't just call anyone that works at a library a librarian, right? I mean, you can. Everyone does. <laughs> um, but no, but, but you're right. Like, not everybody that works at a library is a as you say in quotes, a librarian um, by definition. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different positions. Like, like I said, when I started, I was just a circulation clerk. You know, I was checking in books, checking out books, giving people library cards. I actually have um, a master's degree in library science. You know, for a position for department head, they want you to have that. But there are other, you know, there's other avenues, other types of education that you can have. And maybe um, Michelle can uh, actually... <laughs> add on that. I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, my job title is teen services librarian. And typically, a librarian is considered a master's level position, you would have a master's in library and science, library science, or master's of library and information science. However, in different states, there are different credentials. And in Pennsylvania, you can either have your certification, your state certification as a librarian through having one of those master's degrees, or in my case, I have a bachelor's degree plus, uh, I believe, is it 12 credits, 12 or 15 credits in 12. library science. Yeah. And oh, so okay. that then gives you a provisional licensure. So I have the provisional licensure as a librarian rather than the professional licensure. Now, is there on the job experience that's incorporated into that as well? Because you've got this degree and you've got these credits, but then you also have to have on the ground <laughs> experience or? 
Oh, well, I'll comment on that if, if I may. I, so like officially, I guess you don't really have to. Um, we like it. Um, my personal opinion, so this is, you know, the powers that be, but I personally think any, any on the job experience is way more valuable than anything you will ever get right. um, in, in the classroom in, in a degree. And I kind of actually feel like that is more so. Um, I don't think having a degree makes you a good or a bad librarian. And um, I, I, would, I would love to see, you know, the library world kind of embrace that on the job experience, maybe a little more so and less worrying about having a master's and just, um, you know, you want to attract good people to this profession. So let's, you know, make it accessible. I will add to that. I believe with the school librarian degree, they require like a, to get that degree, they require kind of the equivalent of a student teaching experience. Okay. Right, right. That makes yeah, sense. Public. Yeah. And I imagine every state has its own legislature just like in Ontario here where I am in Canada there's probably nuances and and that's the thing I'm, I'm curious about is in your own experience because I know you interact with other other librarians and other library techs and people who work in libraries and other in other cities and states probably how similar can one assume that their local library and the way that they operate may be similar or different from other libraries or is it pretty much uh, is it is it a dog's breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> it's a dog's breakfast from my experience. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean, I can, Julie, you may have something to add in terms of the public, specific to public libraries, but having worked in a school library, um, an academic library, and now in a public library, I have found pretty significant differences um, from situation to situation. Um, you know, with those three different types of libraries, there's slightly different focuses. Right. So in a school library, the, you know, the focus is going to be how are we supporting the curriculum that's being taught? How are we encouraging, you know, it's very specific to literacy um, and that sort of thing. With an academic library, again, you're still, your focus is still very much on supporting the curriculum, but because you're dealing with that older population in academia, there's a lot more emphasis on research and making research available. And, you know, so the databases and the resources available are gonna be much more nonfiction based. Um, and the literature that's available tends to be, you know, classic literature, you know, and, yeah. and it's a much smaller section like for popular literature. Whereas the public library is kind of this jack of all trades. We've got a, you know, from, cradle to grave and every interest that that could possibly encompass, we need to find a way to, you know, bring that all together. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much said it there. I mean, and if you're, as far as you're talking about different states, was that your original question, Mark? Um, just yeah. that, yeah, I mean, each, each state has different guidelines, different structures. Um, us being in the Poconos, we have a lot of people, um, we're very close to the border of New York and New Jersey. So we have people um, moving from those areas and they will have certain expectations about maybe how their um, library was run. They probably have a lot more funding. New, New Jersey's is, they are state workers. They are, they have really good funding. Whereas Pennsylvania are, we are actually, we're not uh, state or even government workers. We're just a nonprofit um, that receives state and uh, local county funding. Um, but that also means we don't have, we don't have the big bucks like some of those other states do. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you for, for just kind of giving me that lay of the land as, as I slowly zoom in, <laughs> zoom in a little bit more on your specific situations. What would a typical day in the life, uh, okay, pre-COVID, and, and I know Michelle, maybe you can only look at your previous library experience other than the one now, but what's a, what's a typical day in the life of, or, or even what is a typical day of a life? Because I, I imagine some of the tasks are, are the same, you just not physically necessarily in the same location, right? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I, know, I wouldn't even say that typical is, there isn't typical, it's, it's different all the time, but just um, we'll say maybe average day. Okay. Um, before COVID, um, so for myself, so I'm um, so my children's librarian, so it would depend. Um, it could be um, like you would start off in the morning, we'd have um, our preschool story time, um, followed by our lapsit for, um, so it's a story time for the little toddlers. Um, if you're expecting 
libraries to be quiet and you know like maybe some people have that impression um yeah. if you had come <clears throat> to our library right after the programs had let out you would have seen mass chaos in a really good way um you would literally <laughs> You would walk through our children's department watching your feet so as to not step over a baby, you know, crossing your path, um, kids playing, reading, um, you know, just really excited about libraries. Um, I hope we, we get to that once again. Um, but, you know, you're answering um, reference desks, so you're helping people answer questions. So it could be anything from like, where's the dinosaur books to um, school assignments, just to, hey, can you recommend a really good book? Um, you never know what. Uh, kind of questions you're going to get. So that is always very interesting. Okay, cool. Thank you. For sure. For sure. And since I'm a programming librarian, my primary job is to come up with programs for the teens that they might be interested in. Um, and I do have those desk shifts where I'm going to be encountering the activities that Julie just described. But you know, a typical day is going to kind of vary to your job title. So a cataloger, you know, they're going to spend their day doing a lot of data entry and a lot of processing of physical materials and that sort of thing. You know, a reference librarian is going to spend a lot of time at the desk dealing with the public right. and the various questions they have, which may be, you know, where do I find this book or how do I make this computer work? Or can you help me fill out an online job application or whatever? And a programming like librarian, I don't know, I kind of feel like we have this really strange job that we we may be doing activities that people are looking at and going, that's library work? You know, for example, last week, my desk was full of balls of yarn because I'm putting together take and make um, projects for the teens, uh, you know, as we've been in the pandemic and people are just looking for activities and we can't have these in-person gatherings. Obviously we've done a lot of Zoom pro programming, but we've also had these, I've, I've started doing these take and makes where they're, you know, like a little craft kit or something that they can, you know, pick up, take home and do it at their leisure. Right. So you know, for December, I punched holes in a thousand nine ounce solo cups so that they could make a, a sparkling disco dome for New Year's. Now I'm, you know, winding a thousand balls of yarn for, you know, next month. So there can be some really strange things that don't look quote unquote library-ish. I love yeah. that. We oftentimes say, I can't believe we get paid to do this. Stuff. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. That's fantastic. How, um, how much would, you know, children's services and programming, would you interact with other people from the library? Like when I, when I worked in a bookstore, for example, if, if I was in charge of the children's section or in charge of the fiction or in charge of whatever, um, we, we used to have specialists who would oversee areas of the store, um, but we interacted a lot. Like there was a lot of crossover. There was a lot of cross pollination and sharing is that the same thing in a typical library or at least in your experiences? Yeah, I would say so. Go ahead, Julie, you have probably more to say. I mean, I think you have to, I mean, as far as like different, if you're talking about different departments, um, yeah. I mean, so well, like we have our, so main departments are a circulation department. So they're checking things, checking out. Um, you know, we don't have to necessarily confer with them so much on programs, but as far as, um, you know, maybe making sure people have access to materials or we may forewarn them if, hey, we're about to have a program with a magician and 200 kids are going to come, you know, be prepared. You're going to be really busy. Fair enough. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. We, we do a lot of collaboration too with just, and Michelle's job by nature, she does service our five counties, but um, other librarians do that too. We often confer and, you know, get program ideas from each other. So I think that's really important. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of idea sharing, um, okay. you know. Oh, oh, that's a great idea. How did you do that? Give me the directions. I need to do that with my kids or adapt it or, you know, something like that. Um, cool. Yeah. So I want to go, Michelle, I want to talk specifically about some of the programming that you've done because I've been, as an author, I've been fortunate enough to get to participate remotely because, you know, I don't live close enough. I could potentially drive there in a day. But <laughs> I, uh, I got to participate in one of your teen uh, programs. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that was and what it brought for the teens in the, in the local community? 
Yeah, so you were our culminating activity for a uh, five previous to your week. We had five. Ooh, weeks I sound important a... or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. Um, so again, previous to when you joined us, we had five weeks of a writer's workshop for our teens. And it was an adaptation of a program that's been presented by a couple of community members for Julie, what, about 10 years? Oh, yeah. About Eight or 10 years mm -hmm. um, that they've been running an in-person workshop, writer's workshop. And my understanding had been that it was a pretty popular program. So, you know, given that I already have a lot of the wheel to reinvent with the, with the pandemic, I thought, hey, if there's a, something in the past that has worked and people look forward to it, let's see if we can adapt it to the Zoom environment. So I reached out to the folks who had instructed in the past and I said, hey, you know, would you be willing to work with me to make this um, you know, possible in the Zoom environment? And they were really, they were thrilled to be asked very enthusiastic about it. And so we worked together to come up with a format and a plan and they presented it. And the kids were, you know, really, we had a good, good feedback from the kids. They were so excited to have it happen. It was a, it was indeed a popular program. And I, well, to give credit to you, Mark, <laughs> you, you listened to me, you know, we've been friends for a long time and you listened to me early in the pandemic, just kind of having a meltdown over the fact that I started this job two weeks before everything shut down and oh my God, I'm supposed to connect with all the teens of the county and I've never even met any of them face to face and I can't do this. Why would they want to do this? And, you know, you, you were very encouraging and you said, oh, yeah, how did we meet? And I said, through our blogs, yeah, you know how to create compelling and interesting um, programming, even if, if we're not meeting face to face. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and you said, hey, I also do programming. And I said, oh my God, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I kind of, you know, stuck that in my hip pocket to think about, you know, where it would work best to, uh, utilize your skills and your offer and it, it was a really great dovetail to have you kind of round out our series for the teen writers and I know the kids who attended were you know really tickled to kind of hear what you had to say and I remember particularly the young lady who had questions about poetry because the workshop was definitely geared more toward fiction writing right so I know she was in particularly um, encouraged by uh, some of the direct um, responses that you gave to her questions. And so, so. thank you. Uh, and, and so basically the, f the foundation was instead it would have been meeting on a weekly or bi-weekly basis in, 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 in one of the branches with mm -hmm. the two instructors. Uh, but then you just right. migrated that to online, which did that allow it to expand? Like were, were more people able to attend because of that? Or did you try to keep it the, a, a tight knit group? We made it open to whoever wanted to come and we were hopeful uh, because my understanding is that in the past transportation was an issue for some of the participants. And so we were hopeful that maybe it was going to attract some of the people who'd had difficulty with that before since they wouldn't actually have to hop in the car to get there. And um, that did not really seem to be the case. However, um, participation since the pandemic has been way down in, in programming right. um, for teens. However, our CERC stats have shown that the teens are, the teen materials, the young adult books are circulating. They have a higher percentage than anybody else, any of the other subgroups. Physical, so physical YA books? Yeah, physical oh, YA okay. books. Um, the circulation of physical YA books has at the last check was the highest of all the different groups in the library population. Um, but the, the programming, they've dropped way off. That said, our writers program had the best response, um, the most consistent response of pretty much any of the programming that we've had. So even though it didn't necessarily expand to be a bigger group than it had in the past, it still, you know, was successful in that standpoint. Probably had a lot to do with the fact that you had consistent instructors that have been with the program for a while and yes. known and trusted. Yes, yeah. there were definitely some repeat participants. There were some new participants, 
but there was a core of repeat participants who were really glad to see that that program had continued. Cool. So I have to explore writerly questions for my audience. And so one of the biggest questions writers have, especially uh, in, in the spaces I operate in, there's a lot of ebooks and digital selling. I'm going to ask you how you acquire digital books. But I want to ask you uh, acquisition in general, because they're oftentimes like the poet, uh, the young poet is left out of everything. It's got all the excitement and all the buzz. Ah, oh, you're left out of that because poetry is a different thing, right? It doesn't work here. It works here. And so um, what I'm curious about is there's a lot of folks who've written children's books or they've written uh, young readers and young adult books. And the, that hasn't migrated to digital nearly the way that well, YA has and adult content. But I'm curious as to the acquisition process uh, so authors can understand how to best make the work obviously resolve the problem the library has of great books to put in the hands of the right readers um, and um, uh, remove as many paths of resistance that will block you from being able to uh, acquire something that looks intriguing because there's, a, there's something that you, you find there. How does that whole process work? So um, you have two people who actually don't, we don't directly purchase eBooks ourselves. So that's actually handled um, our adult services do it. We have several ebook platforms that we use. Um, okay. uh, Overdrive is probably, you know, the big one that everyone's heard of. Um, so they can purchase various titles. One of the challenges with the ebook platforms, um, as librarians are finding, um, in, and this is kind of the debate in the ebook world right now, is some publishers will limit the number of times a book is sort of, in essence, checked out. So whereas you're buying a print book and you've got it until either it gets lost or gets destroyed or whatever, um, you buy this ebook and publishers will say, okay, it can be checked out, let's say um, 30 times or what, whatever, whatever they set. And then that's it. You have to like repurchase it again, um, which you can imagine that can get really expensive in the, in the long run. Right. Um, and it depends too on when it's, if it's a more current release, they may have limited versus something that's been out for like, you know, 30 years, um, you may have it limited. That's probably one of the biggest challenges I would say that we face as far as, you know, libraries go. Okay. Yeah, and as far as like the picture books and things we have, um, and, and it's escaping me right now, Michelle, can you think of um, the, the uh. show? I have tumble books, tumble books. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something that we do through um, Pennsylvania has the power library, which you can get different platforms for free if you have a Pennsylvania library card. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, and um, so there's a lot of ebooks on there, but tumble books is something we have. And um, that one has like storybooks and nonfiction and chapter right. books and things for younger kids on there. What about physical? What about physical? I, and I know you guys don't do acquisitions, but I, is there a central repository in Pennsylvania? Do you buy them from larger wholesalers like Baker and Taylor or Ingram, or how does that how does that usually work? Are you, are you talking eBooks now or print? print? Print. I'm talking print now. Yeah. Oh, I do acquisitions for print materials. Just oh, not... then you know that really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, we, I, I, yeah. Well, I do purchase all my children's materials except for um, the eBooks. Um, yeah, we, so um, Baker and Taylor, uh, a Baker and Taylor and Amazon are, are the two primary. Well, Amazon, vendors. so you actually purchase right off of the, uh, right off of the website? Yeah, so they have business accounts. The, I pr pretty much mostly use it for um, like DVDs, audiovisual material. Um, right. The prices right. tend to be a little better. And sometimes, honestly, Amazon has good deals on library binding so i will go and like look for the really inexpensive markdown things there but baker and taylor is probably the primary book vendor we use okay um, and, I and then also there. junior library guild yes so i have a standing order with junior library guild is so that a distribution facility or is that a curation facility i have no idea what is <laughs> junior <laughs> library guild. <laughs> junior library guild is um no, they, 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 they aim to issue um, very well, well-reviewed, high-quality children's literature. So okay. they will have different categories. So I have a standing order. So you can choose your categories. Let's say um, beginner readers, fantasy for teens, high yeah. interest. I mean, there's 
there's tons of categories. So you put um, an order in for this category and they go, Hey, I got, I got you covered. Here's a bunch of good stuff. Yeah. Yes. You don't okay. order by title. You order by category. Yeah. So that's, that's like they do the curation. So there's, there's millions of things to choose from and they've done research and say, Hey, here are the award winners here. Like we have the silver birch awards here in Canada. You know, it's a silver birch nominee. Therefore it's probably worthwhile. <laughs> that kind of thing. Just, just the opposite. A lot of times Junior Library Guild will pick the books and then they'll end up being like, actually they're about to, to do the Youth Meet Awards like Newberry Caldecott. Right. Um, yeah, they yeah. often end up being, yeah, just they'll okay. end up being winners. Okay, excellent. No, I'm just curious about that because authors are always curious about well, how, do I, how do I get a library interested in my, in my books and then how do I make them available? Uh, two right. libraries, both for print as well as free book or even even audiobook. So with audiobook, um, digital audio again is probably not your your forte. But I know Overdrive uh, is like Overdrive, Hoopla, some of those other uh, platforms. You mentioned there were a few other platforms. Do you besides Overdrive? Um, right, Hoopla. Hoopla is the other one. Um, oh my gosh, I'm I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, Biblioteca digital, but that just got absorbed by what overdrive um, yeah I think so. uh, biblioteca odillo maybe um i'm trying to think of some of the other platforms there's there, there's many there's many of them unfortunately but okay yeah overdrive and hoopla are the main ones for our library if you are wondering how you so what you want to know is how authors can get libraries interested in their books yeah how do how do, how do they yeah how do they do that that's a different question. So for, okay, so again, my, my experience is from children's and teens perspective. So there's really two different things. So we've kind of talked about the indie publishing and the traditional publishing. Yeah. So what I'm looking for when I add a book to my collection, I'm looking for A, just, you know, bestsellers, things that are high interest, people that are requesting. Yeah. I'm looking often, you know, the major publishers will be the first thing that we'll look for, of course, but, you know, we're open to other things. So if I had say, I actually, I, I, I can give you an example. There is a, a woman uh, who lives in our area. She got published her picture book through Holiday House. And she didn't even ask me actually to add her book. She just said, hey, I got this book published. And of course we want to support local authors. So I said, oh my gosh, that's great. You know, we, we bought one for every, every branch. I think the tricky thing comes in with the indie publishers because, you know, especially with the kids books. So, so I feel like there's a difference between adult versus children. What I've had the experience with is, is children's authors that maybe have not done their homework, haven't done their research, and they've written this book really quickly and they say, hey, add it. And I think they have, sometimes they just think that all they have to do is have this book in the library and all of a sudden everyone's going to want to read it and buy it. <laughs> And when, if you're going to write for kids and youth, you have to do your homework. It has to be well written. This, this is the introduction to a child's, you know, grammar. They are learning. Everything has to be perfect. If there are any errors, I'm not going to add it because we need to demonstrate good literature to children. Right. Um, now, you, you know, so, which is why I am a little reluctant to add indie published books, especially, um, you know, longer ones too, because they haven't necessarily been read or edited and I'm not going to read your 300 page novel to find out, you know, if there are, you know, errors. So yeah. I will be more receptive to youth that has been traditionally published. Okay. Now, as far as an adult goes, now I feel like you've been adult, you've grown, I, you know, you should be able to distinguish at this point, you know, is this a good book? Do I like it? Yes or no? You know, you might have an easier time as an adult author. Is there something that an author who is with a really small traditional publisher who is nowhere on your radar typically, or an indie author who has done their homework and has maybe some accolades or some amazing reviews on retail sites because they actually have gotten great feedback and done their homework. Are there ways that they can um, float above the sludge? And, and be and be a little bit more visible because I understand you're looking at this giant minefield of a lot of anyone can push a button and publish. I, I, I get that having having been a bookseller dealing with that before uh, before we, it exploded in the way it has. Are there things that authors can do to help a library with the curation process to understand the quality? 
Are there like Kirkus reviews or are there other resources you use? I'll say, even though I don't have the purchasing authority for acquisitions, part of my job is to give recommendations for YA acquisitions to all the libraries in the county because, you know, I am the teen services librarian for the entire county. <laughs> so they don't all, you know, all the directors and, you know, some of the libraries are very small and they just don't have time to kind of weed through what's available. And one of the things just in the short time that I've been in this position that I have looked at in terms of giving those recommendations are, where are the holes in our collection? Where, where do we need to beef the collection up? You know, obviously Julie mentioned, you know, what kind of requests are we getting that we can't fill? That's one example of a hole. Another one you know, that's become really obvious, particularly in the past year is representation. And, you know, are there are there books from certain marginalized groups by authors from those groups that are speaking to that experience? And so some of the books that I have recommended um, have come from, you know, smaller presses because they fill that void. Um, so for example, I, you know, I, I was kind of um, analyzing the collection for Black Lives, for Latinx, um, voices and then also for indigenous voices and I found that our collection of indigenous voices was almost non-existent <laughs> right um, you know and and in the it you know there are some of the the hot authors in in the traditional publishing world but in doing some of the research I found different different websites and different sources that were kind of um, coalescing a lot of different books and authors that I, you know, they did provide reviews, whereas like Kirkus didn't. Um, and I could kind of look through those and I was able to, you know, come up with a, a nice list that way because I was specifically looking for information about that. And so people naturally rose to the top in that way. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna take this from a perspective of an author who is either traditionally published, so the book's easily available <laughs> through major channels, or if it's uh, self-published, then it may be available through some of the channels, uh, not as easy to find potentially. An author who's interested in approaching whether they're a local author or, or they have maybe something that could be of value. So for example, um, somebody from an own voices uh, that says, hey, I represent this community and I know there's not a lot of representation, so they may not be local, but maybe they have something through a traditional press or, or through one of the other channels. What are ways you would recommend that an author get in touch with the library that reduces the amount of work you have to do and makes your job easier? Because I think if they can have the right thing and reduce the amount of work you have to do, uh, are there things you would recommend that you would prefer to see or not see maybe? Um, I think if you can, and I honest, I realize this is not realistic for everyone, if you can, you'll get the best response if you can talk to them in person, I think, um, versus an email. Right. We get so many emails, it's easy for us to just ignore um, phone call, right. you know, but I think if authors, especially if it's your local library, if you're you, like, if you're an author and a writer, you should go to your library, you know, get to know your librarian, um, if you can build up a rapport with them. Um, you'll get a, um, I think you'll get a good response. You know, we do, no, I can think of some, some indie authors who have things that are, have been added to our collection and they do programs at the library and we see them, um, you know, we chat with them. And I, I think that's really, really helpful. You'll, you'll get a good insight too, as to what's going on at the library, um, what kind of books people are looking for, which would maybe give you ideas of things, maybe, hey, I should maybe write about this. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, sometimes people come in and we've never seen them before and we never see them again, you know. Um, just, I think too, the other thing is just to approach it, um, hey, I have this book and and just consider it. You know, I don't, you're not really, neither one of them's putting pressure or anything. Would you be interested? And you can leave your name, leave the book with them, give the library a chance to look it over, you know, don't, you know, right. so they have time to, to think it over and not be put on the spot by that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And without that feeling like an overwhelming thing, like, oh my gosh, I have to go build relationships with two dozen different libraries. No, you really don't, <laughs> I, I would say. Because if you've built a good relationship with the libraries that you use, that's a starting, librarians talk to each other. <laughs> you know, I was like, 
<laughs> no, so when I come come across something really great or somebody else comes across something really great, they're like, hey, this is really great. Let me tell you about this. And you'll kind of get that free word of mouth, you know, it, and it goes right. both ways. You know, if it's if it's crap, <laughs> they're going to tell each other that it's crap, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which is, I think is critical. Yeah. So to, so to that end, if I'm a local author and I have experience in maybe an area I've researched because I, I know, I know something really interesting that I had to use in my book or uh, I'm a nonfiction author, obviously the book is about how to do something could be uh, useful for programming or maybe even how to write, <laughs> how to write, how to find a publisher, how to, how to go through the process. Uh, if an author has skills like that, is that a valuable thing where they, they reach out and say, Hey, I've, I've done these books. Um, this is what I specialize in. I'm more than happy to help you if you need any help with a, a class or a course or content. Is that, is that a useful thing that authors can do to, to, to develop positive relate, hopefully positive relationships if everything goes well? Um, that's actually a really great approach to do it. Um, actually, if you do have that and you have that ability to do a program, I would say that's probably one of the best ways to, to kind of get your foot in the door. We have done that actually. Um, We've done, we had one actually before the pandemic. They wanted the, the, these, we had um, some, some local people and they wanted to just kind of add their book as an author. And then when I found out the book was about, um, uh, she was, a, she was a, I can't remember the exact word, but she worked, she worked in a hospital. She worked with kids um, who were sick, like cancer and things. And she was finding ways to reduce their stress. And I was like, well, that's your program. I was like, you, you need to, you know, you can talk about your book, but let's, let's, teach these kids ways to cope with stress. Um, you know, I think that's, if you have a skill, a special skill and you can use that to help your community, I mean, why wouldn't you? Cool, awesome. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, un unless there's any last bits of advice you can offer to authors out in the world, um, is there, are there any sort of last thoughts that you like, I just like to leave them with? Well, they always say that to be a good writer, you've got to read a lot. Get a whole library full of reading material. Visit your local library. <laughs> Great way to build those relationships too. You know, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, ask, ask, find out what the, the best sellers are, what's hot right now and read, and read those. That's a good point. Excellent. Yeah, that is true. I think it was Stephen King that said, if you want to write, you've got to read a lot. Well, many, many successful writers have said that. Ladies, thank you so much. It's so insightful, so informative, so inspiring. Uh, I'm going back and taking all kinds of uh, learnings away from this. And I know I know my listeners are going to love it. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to talk about two specific things from the interview. The first thing was Julie talked about curation and how librarians do curation. And this is something I had never learned before, despite talking to so many different librarians and listening to librarians being interviewed, because I don't think I had actually heard uh, a youth, a child youth services librarian talk about this. This is critical. Now, we know there's a bit of a bias against self-published books. And in some cases, librarians have been... Um, burned because they bought stuff that they thought was good because the, the the price was low and realized that not necessarily everything is good out there. And and this is not a, a slight against professional indie authors. The chance that you're listening to this podcast means you're a professional author who cares about learning and researching and understanding the business of writing and publishing. And that is a critical aspect for being a professional but I am talking about the fact that you can push a button and publish anything without editing, without marketing, without doing any of those important aspects uh, to make it the best book that it can be. And in most cases, in those online catalogs, Amazon, Kobo, Apple, Nook, etc., the books are out there. And and Julie says this, and, and I just want to reiterate it, like adults, they, they can figure out for themselves whether or not it's good. But the curators, the librarians who are bringing in books for kids, whether they're print books to put on the shelves, whether they're ebooks that they're purchasing or even audiobooks that they're purchasing to make available to patrons, they're doing the curation for the children because the children are trusting them 
to have the best content. And obviously, they're going to want to look for the best content. So it's kind of like adults, yeah, you're on your own. We're a little bit less uh, picky because you can do some of that curation yourselves. But for the kids, we need to be very, very careful because this may be their first time picking up a book. And we want to make sure that that's the best possible experience they can. So that's an important thing to consider. If you are a YA, a young reader, uh, author, a picture book, etc., what are the things that you can do to demonstrate to a librarian that you have done your homework, you understand your audience, and, and you actually have a professional product? Because, yes, there is a bias. Yes, there is a prejudice against indie authored uh, books, uh, as you heard, for uh, some curators. But there are ways you can get to it. Julie gave an example of wanting to support local authors and going and ordering a book uh, that she found out about from a local author. It wasn't even a pitch. It was just, oh, I've got a new book available. And then she went out and got it. So there is a desire to support and work with and help local authors, regardless of how the book is published. But again, there is going to be an assumption of the quality of that material. And so one of the ways, uh, and, and both Julie and Michelle spoke about this, is being involved in your library, actually using the local library. Start local. Always start local. You can have relationships. You can work with them. You can offer programming opportunities for them. And, uh, you know, for a kid's programming, maybe offer to do readings, maybe offer to talk about, you know, storytelling, any of, any of those things that could, could be a tie-in because you're bringing value to the librarians. The librarians get to know you. And that can begin those discussions. And and here's one of the reasons why I like starting with local. Start with local because there's a better chance for you to have a relationship. And no, you can't. As Michelle said, you can't have a relationship with everyone around the world. But librarians talk. You know, pre-pandemic days, they would meet at uh, conferences. Uh, ALA is uh, our American Library Association or the Ontario Library Association here in Ontario. Where, uh, you know, they would they'd meet together in conference and network. And they talk to one another when they find a really, really good book that they love, especially if it's an unknown book. This is the thing booksellers do too. Librarians do this. I find a book that I loved and I would share it with every bookstore manager or staff member I bumped into and say, oh my God, you've got to bring this in. It was awesome. I mean, that's, that is how the Hunger Games took off. It was independent booksellers hand selling and talking about these books from Suzanne Collins. That happens in libraries too. So that's really, really important. The other thing I wanted to talk about doesn't necessarily have to do with libraries, but it has to do with online relationships. And it's maybe kind of related to the library thing here, because how do you connect with the librarian when there's a pandemic going on and you can't physically be in there and, 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 and be right in front of them where they can actually see you in action and see how amazing and professional you are? And it goes back to how Michelle and I met. Now, she sort of referenced this in the interview, but I want to explain a bit of the background. Michelle and I have never met in person, but I feel like she is a dear friend. She lives in Pennsylvania. I live in Ontario, Canada, and we haven't met. But we did connect online in 2005. So, what, 16 years ago. Um, I'm recording this in uh, the winter of 2021. I still feel like she's a dear friend. We connected through writing, through blogging. Um, I followed her blog. She followed my blog. She was creative and funny and entertaining. As you can tell, she has a skeleton named Bona Lisa, and we really have to arrange a double date for uh, Barnaby and, uh, and Bona Lisa, Michelle and I, to maybe talk books together while they can they can talk bones, I guess. But the cool thing is, is we've curated this relationship over the years and stayed in touch, stayed in touch. Uh, initially, it was through blogging. Now it's through other forms of social media where we follow one another. It's, it's Facebook and Instagram and things like that. And, and because Michelle's a, a brilliantly wonderful, funny and creative person, it feels like, you know, she was a sister who was separated at birth. Uh, and, uh, I, I like uh, following her because she's entertaining and funny and, and inspiring. And and so that relationship uh, just, I mean, obviously led to Michelle and Julie coming onto my podcast. 
But it also led to uh, when she started working for libraries, uh, that led to me having an opportunity to come and talk to uh, the, the writer's group there, the, the, the teen writing program. And I don't think about the things that I do as a writer. I don't think about what's going to get me a sale today. I think about what is going to cultivate my professional brand as an author. And obviously, because I'm also a, a business professional, I'm a, I'm a representative in the book industry. What are the things that are going to help cultivate that? And obviously, I got a chance to talk uh, as, as a writer to these uh, students, but also share a little bit of insights in terms of opportunities available for writers uh, through you know free programs and all kinds of resources that are available out there. And it may not lead to sales. Maybe there were some, uh, I, I actually do believe that uh, they did acquire some of my books for writers for the library, and I, I don't know if it was print or ebook or, or, or whatever, um, but there may actually have been some students in the class who may remember me and may end up wanting to go and check out some of my books in the future. So I don't, I don't think necessarily about everything I do has to be a measurable, oh, I did this, therefore I sold that. What what I like to look at in terms of long term planning and and brand building as an author is, I did this, therefore I established this relationship. I was a member and participant of this community, and maybe it's because I believe in the karmic value of the universe. But I know that those things are going to come back to haunt me in a positive way, and it may be ten years in the future where that comes back. But I'm fine with that because I'm not only thinking about the short term. I'm thinking about all of those long term things of myself as a writer, as a creator, and obviously as a business professional. It's about cultivating and curating strong relationships, kind of like the relationship that Michelle and I have, even though we have yet to have had the the, the, the privilege of getting to meet in person, which I know will post pandemic <laughs> happen. And that's really, really important too, because oftentimes we worry about the short term. We worry about that book launch that's going on and what we're going to do in the first 60 to 90 days and all of those other elements. And and this goes back to something, and I'm sure I've said this on the podcast before, but there was a used bookstore in my hometown or in Sudbury, Ontario, well, Sudbury, the big city, which was an hour uh, south of my hometown. And it was called Bay Used Books, and they always had a little stamp they would put in their books. And, and I got a significant amount of my books, uh, initial books for my personal library from Bay Used Books because it was very affordable. And the stamp said, uh, a book you haven't read is a new book. And that's the other cool thing about this long-term relationship is there can be titles that you've published years ago that are new. I was even... Earlier today, and today is what, February 11th, 2021, as I'm recording this. And I'd posted something about uh, the, uh, the technically the third book in a series, the Canadian Werewolf series of mine. And and I was posting a joke about the Rush references, because I obviously love the, the Canadian rock band Rush. And and it was it was it was kind of a meme. And I was I was posting a joke about it, but because I was posting the joke about that, I referred to the book I was referring to, and that led to people noticing I was talking about this Canadian werewolf series, and them saying, "Wait a minute, how did I not know about this?" Well, I released my very first novel in the Canadian werewolf series, which wasn't really a series when I released it, back in two thousand and sixteen. And so it's, what, four or five years later, and somebody's now just discovering it. And I realize, as I'm releasing Fear and Longing in Los Angeles later in February, there are going to be people who have not read anything, have no idea who I am. Actually, most people will have never read anything of mine or know who I am. But they may discover this new book that comes out because I'm doing some marketing and some hype, and then go back and read the whole series. So it doesn't matter that the first book came out years and years ago. It's new to the people who haven't discovered it. And that can be the same thing for libraries. So think about the long term. Think about the relationships. Think about the curation. All of those elements are really, really important when it comes to libraries. 
Well, that's it for this episode of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this podcast, feel free to share it with someone that you think would find value in the content. You can also leave a review over on the podcatcher of your choice. I would love to receive a review because reviews help other people discover the podcast too, and that would be greatly appreciated. Other ways you can support the podcast are through my Patreon account over at patreon.com slash starkreflections, where for as little as a dollar, three dollars, or five dollars a month, you can gain access to additional audio content, including my reflections on other podcasts, as well as other content that I make available for patrons. And I want to pause to say thank you to all of my amazing patrons who help provide additional funding that help me with purchasing extra equipment for the show and also paying for a bit of my time in producing of this weekly podcast that I am privileged and lucky that I get to bring to you every single week. So thank you to all my patrons and thank you to you, the listener. So that is, as I said, the end of episode 177. So until next week in episode 178, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. <laughs>